endobronchial ultrasound indication and contraindication. I thought uh, every PG who is getting TB chest uh, admission nowadays knows about EBUS and all indication they know. So what I will speak and uh, merely we say only five or four indication of this fancy tool. So <coughs> to do so, what I did is simpler. I don't have any disclosure to all are my cases and uh, I completely own the responsibility for that, if any. But I would say what is the importance of EBUS TBNA and not to forget our beloved conventional TBNA. I will just speak a two minute on that. Uh, we'll see briefly mediastinal uh, anatomy. Uh, I will not go into detail in much, but let's try to interact whatever we are here. Uh, not to be a monotonous, I don't want to be sound like monotonous, but let's speak up, stand up and ask uh, if I ask or if any doubt in that. We will learn in a indication through the cases of mine. I will share only five, six cases, not more than that. One, uh, and uh, we'll see evidence which whatever the question I uh, ask myself, we see very, whether they are evident proof or not. And if uh, per time permits, then we'll see contraindication. I would not say contraindication. EBUS is very safe procedure, I, I would say, throughout the, my journey of intervention pulmonology. Uh, I would say you should aware about the complication rather than the uh, contraindication. So here we go. In the era of precision medicine where we are targeting the targeted medicine and we are learning the precise medicine, we need to target lung cancer as a immunotherapy or uh, to improve their survival. So that precise medicine, we need a molecular testing and it, if we require a molecular testing, no more PET scan uh, staging of lung cancer is advisable nowadays. So to do so that the EBUS clinical implication does happen. So what are the indication as I already mentioned that mostly staging of lung cancer, whether it preoperatively or postoperatively, to do restaging post-op or diagnose centrally located uh, intrapulmonary tumorals. Uh, benign mediastinal lymph anopathy is another diagnostic modality done by EBUS and not to forget the therapeutic indication of EBUS. I will show a few cases. Uh, we can access 2, 4, 7, 10, 11, 12 uh, lymph nodes. I am not going to in detail. I think subsequent speaker will tell about this. but to be an intervention pulmonologist and if you want to do EBUS, you have to by heart the good knowledge of CT anatomy and the stations and which node you, you can't access by the EBUS. So to learn what not to do is more important than to do. So here we go with the, my first case, this uh, young male with Bertschiari syndrome undergone maybe TIPS uh, five years ago, presented with dry cough, weight loss of three kg, in last two months, uh, constitutional symptoms were there, loss of appetite. Uh, laboratory workup was almost near to normal except a uh, few inflammatory markers were little bit raised. INR was 1.8 as he was on oral congulator. So let's see the CT thorax. A lung window was clearly fine, but can you see the right paratracheal node here? A big, large one, the subcarinal nodes, okay. <coughs> In a coronal section, also right paratracheal, what we called as a 4R and 7th junction. So my question to the audience, does EBUS indicated in this, whether it will be a diagnostic or a therapeutic? I would say diagnostic, let's say. What to expect from this case? And do we require a rose bile doing this simple case of mediastinal lymphadenopathy and need to sample all the nodes, whatever the station we have seen in the CECT. Anyone from the audience? Okay, I have been told to make you interact. <laughs> so if anyone can say, answer this question, then EBUS is the indication will be resolved. So we go one by one. So I did a EBUS, no doubt in that. So just see the morphology of the lymph node. It's a heterogeneous necrotic area, a lot of necrotic area you can see. And uh, anyway, uh, the lymph node <coughs> uh, which uh, is shown in the images, it has been measured, uh, measured and then uh, we did a EBUS, simply granulomatous lymphadenopathy. 
And uh, the question arises that uh, if the large node is there, what size of lymph node you should go for the EBUS tBNA and the other thing you should go for the conventional tBNA. So learning from the case one is simple that any lymph node, uh, whether it is a looking benign or malignant, you should do a sampling as per the <coughs> conveniency. So case two. 53 year old man, chronic smoker with 2 3 BD per day since last 23 years, with no comorbidity presented with the dry cough, dyspnea, constitutional symptoms like loss of appetite, loss of weight since 5 months. Loss of weight 2 3 kg in the last 5 months on ovulation found to have a thrombocytopenia, hepatomegaly, and mediastinal lymph lymphadenopathy. With this, the history, the scan was showing like this huge node and uh, subcarinal with soft tissue opacity can you see in a right uh, uh, intermediate bronchus and little bit diverticular mean esophagus with hepatosplenomegaly <coughs> the laboratory workup was almost thrombocytopenia it's just 30,000 and huge large node so my question is again the same does EBUS indicated in this it, it will be a diagnostic patient is chronic smoker uh, with thrombocytopenia and just a history of two month dry cup and dyspnea. And what, what we are expecting with thrombocytopenia, hepatosplenomegaly and this kind of CT picture, whether we need to do rows or not. So if we answer all this question, yes, EBUS is indicated, but this thrombocytopenia could be a contraindication. So what is the line of a safer margin to do a EBUS TBNA when patient is thrombocytopenic. So I would say I did a EBUS in this case with a single donor. Uh, so it's a, it was on EBUS is a, has a huge homogeneous mass lesion and we did a EBUS and uh, EBUS is a very friendly you can uh, puncture a mass and and the most important thing is that beyond the, I will explain you what I am doing right now, this, but beyond the just sampling of uh, cytology, what you need to do is, it, you need to do a good sampling of that particular tissues though. So in the rows, your pathologist will give the answer. So what I got in the rows is this. Any pathologist can say something. So I have put at everything because I thought everybody, everybody will be the pulmonology or maybe. So uh, the f first corner two slide where the rows where I found the cell, my pathologist found cell and he told me that yes. So it was a rounded multinucleated cells. So it was a confusing picture. And to uh, differentiate between the small cell tumor and lymphoma, in such as uh, hepatosplenomegaly and severe thrombocytopenic patient, you required a hard uh, core tissue. So what I did is in that I did a EBUS guided cryonodal biopsy. So this is a cryoprobe which uh, the black one, I go through the same pass which I punctured with the needle and then I took a chunk the pathologist, my pathologist was happy that I gave a good chunk and the cryo TBC was a bit full of cellularity so he can do a further immunomolecular study. So cyto, uh, synapto and CD20 positive is a particularly as uh, Sir said for small cell carcinoma. So the learning points from the case 2 is a very simple. So EBUS is not only giving you us just a simple, but beyond the just transbronchial needle aspiration, you can take a more extra tissue with the other modality like cryonodal or cryomass biopsy. Let's see the third case. A 72 year old male, hypertensive, diabetes, uh, ischemic heart disease, he was undergone uh, PTCA in 2011 with these symptoms, low grade fever, cough, leg pain, vomiting on and off, confusion, weight loss since last six months. So uh, the, all the six month picture was generalized and nothing uh, persistent. Uh, and uh, the labs were unremarkable, but the persistent recurrent hyponatremia was there and he has been treated <coughs> as a nutritional because he was an old gentleman almost 80 year of age and uh, he has been treated as a nutritional and the possible all the significant causes of hyponatremia uh, has been found out. He had a COVID pneumonia six months back 
no other comorbidity but the unexplainable hyponatremia was persistence so this was the investigation busy slides but i would i have read mark the uh, the thing is that sodium persistent overload despite patient on an almost 300 ml per day 3% normal saline has been given and the detail possible all the workup has been done in that uh, they found just a 19 on 15 mm single uh, enlarged node or, or not a single but uh, larger largest was in pre tracheal region uh, the scan was showing like this x-ray was uh, quite okay but uh, they did a workup for the hypernatremia the lung window you can see you cannot make out anything uh, if you see closely but when you show the mediastinal window it was a largest node in pre tracheal and and mediastinal window was like this so my question will be the same to the audience will we do ebus in this case what to expect and we, what to need to rose so my mind was so confused and i decided to go to ebus and i did a ebus though it was a less than 15 mm uh, the rose show me this anyone guess it's a first year pg student ans answer it was a tubercular bacilli and granuloma and to surprise you it uh, he was treated with AKT and within a just three weeks his sodium level was fine so it was adrenal insufficiency due to subclinical tuberculosis i will quickly go through the case four it was a squamous cell carcinoma left uh, buccal mucosa operated operated in 2016 for uh, pa uh, pain in the same region he again came and pet city uh, was done before the surgery was absolutely normal and when he came with the left buccal mucosa again uh, 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 in a 2022 the same operative site for left buccal mucosa was positive and the scan was like this pet scan for restaging just a single node in subcarinal measuring only 14 mm Will you do EBUS in this case? Yes, I did a EBUS. EBUS showed uh, a very simple, at no atypical cell, no granuloma, no malignancy. FB culture is awaited. So uh, the take-home message in doing uh, EBUS staging is to they can straight away to operate the patient. The single PET uh, FDG avid positive note doesn't signify that you should not go to the surgery resurgery is evident if you prove histopathologically fifth case is similar uh, he was uh, operated in 2021 again he came uh, till july he was taking a chemotherapy but this time presentation on the right buccal mucosa and uh, pet you can identify the operative site uh, has a uptake as well as opposite side right buccal mucosa is also uptake with the single trans uh, prevascular uh, node so the uh, the punch biopsy from the uh, surgical site was uh, there so i did a ebus again in this case but the challenge was in this case was uh, mouth opening was zero so i had to go through the nose and uh, ebus came to be a squamous cancer carcinoma so both the case are different and you have to one uh, single node in previous case is a FDG avid similarly but histopathologically non malignancy this case similarly one node only prevascular i went uh, uh, trans arterial uh, route but still it is a positive so in this case pre surgery adjuvant chemotherapy is advisable so that's how ebus can change the course of treatment in oncology so i will not go to detail in the evidence how many passes how many image classification due to this but this has to be learned these are the simply grayscale uh, areas of sonography where you will learn simply which no you need to sample heterogeneity of anechoic hypoechoic or isoechoic homogeneous or heterogeneous calcification size of the node will be always and this is the base slide so far in my pg days i loved while i was doing an intervention that which node we need to poke ideally every node has can be taken but you need to understand while doing a staging uh, you need to categorize the node according to because uh, you can use only one or two needle in one case sorry for interruption sir
yes so time is, is over the last so, so uh, please slide like complete i will not go yes, into detail uh, so it, uh, therapeutic indication it was a huge uh, bronchogenic cyst uh, we can do a puncture yes he was guided advisable and i aspirated this pus pus was afb positive but i advise surgical resection so summarize ebus is very friendly tool less invasive and very uh, good in a malignant and staging and as well as in benign processes uh, staging of uh, surgical ebus if we compare the ebus tbn is far far safer and comparable with the mediastinoscopy and with this uh, regard of this gentleman before uh, being a pulmonologist you uh, become a uh, pulmonologist before becoming a bronchoscopist and before become a bronchoscopist you should become a intervention pulmonologist so when you want to be a target intervention pulmonologist become a bronchoscopist ideally first and then <laughs> you can be similarly he said that learn chest x ray so if you want to do ebus learn ct guided mediastinal advice and i invite the sir for this mediastinal staging thank you the topic given is uh, the how does the ebus uh, you know uh, how do you look at the mediastinum based on the ebus so there are two ways of doing it you know we can go through this entire way and identify all the blood vessels and you can do all the landmarks and everything but that is for the workshop what i am going to tell you is only the simple approach what is used in daily practice what landmarks you need in daily practice that we will discuss of course we need to know this chart even the earlier speaker showed this chart and it's very important we need to know the uh, the anatomy we need to know before because this anatomy the levels are extremely important to prevent any inadvertent puncture and diagnose things properly so just to go on to the background uh, you know ebus these are 20 years now since uh, we started doing the research on ebus and uh, so the papers are published in 2004 but the work started in 2002 so it's we are almost celebrating 20 years of uh, ebus tbna now and it's great to see that in 20 years where ebus has reached everybody is aware of the sensitivity specificity and the techniques and the benefits now these were the these are the pictures i have put here which we took 20 years ago okay so how you could identify lymph nodes you know how are the how is the needle looking from where the needle is done there were a lot of questions will the needle form a track will there be a sinus and now the needle track is used to do cryo biopsy as was also earlier shown so you can do an ebus uh, you can through the track you can put a, a cryo probe and take large samples having said that it is only for selected cases you don't have to do that uh, every day but yes it's possible and the safety has been very well established even hyalur lymph nodes you know you can easily uh, sample hyalur lymph nodes it's just routinely now hyalur lymph nodes can be sampled so mediastinal can be sampled hyalur can be sampled transvascular can be done but again transvascular uh, ebus is not going to be your first case you know you need to have done enough ebus cases you need to have very good enough control on the ebus needle and the procedure and the stable patient not moving patient and then you can think about doing transvascular ebuses i have seen I've, uh, you know it's done under local anesthesia it is done under sedation the important reason you know i've put this these steps are these steps have not not changed in last 20 years you have to uh, do a white light bronchoscopy before you do a ebus and for white light bronchoscopy Uh, because we use some of the olympus scopes and other scopes there are newer scopes which say you have only a 10 degree view and you don't need to do a normal bronchoscopy and you can suggest but uh, you know uh, looking at the airway is extremely enough so the first step is look at the entire airway with a white light bronchoscope it's a 2 minute job and it, i think it's also good opportunity in learning if you have a team if you have young people they can all do the white light bronchoscopies first and then you can take the ebus and the ebus can be done by the more senior people or you know who are up in the training ladder so the steps are very clear you have to in the uh, uh, you have to you may or may not use the balloon you identify the vessels is extremely important separate the vessels from the lymph nodes and take the sample <clears throat> now was shown you know uh, typically done through oral route we actually started doing uh, ebus through the nasal route initially 
and then you know we moved to doing it through the oral route because those who are doing nasal did uh, nasal and i just want to say that laryngeal mask or the igel is a very good tool and can be utilized uh, very efficiently and uh, this is the difference so i've just highlighted the difference on how the igel uh, is used so a lot of our pay but important thing you know with igel scope can get damaged early so you have to choose which case you will do igel and which case you will do just through the oral cavity there are selected cases uh, you know, for, for me, those are the short neck, extremely obese patients, thick neck patients. It's just easier to have the eye gel in place. So now we move to the anatomy. Now, <clears throat> again, this is the work which was done with Yasufuku. So these are uh, slides, uh, or the, rather the pictures are, uh, you know, uh, already published by Yasufuku. The way to do the EBUS is once the white light bronchoscopy is done, and if you want to do a systemic uh, uh, evaluation, what I do is you can just put the scope directly into the right main bronchus. You look at the intermediate bronchus, in, go into the lower lobe bronchus. And now, if you want to look at the station, uh, you know, we are talking about the station 12, you know, here. And if you're looking at the space, station 10, 12, you need to press the tip against, look at this, the point is given here very well. Press the tip against the lower lobe bronchus, just proximal to where the basal bronchus start to branch out and the station 12 can be visualized here. Okay, so again, we are going through only the practical steps of the mediastinal anatomy here. Go down, go into the lower lobe again. And this is the place where you don't, you know, uh, putting the balloon can be a bit tricky. You can, I think, often get away with do, doing this without the balloon. So you've looked at the station number 12. Then you come to station 11. Then you have to straighten the scope. You withdraw the scope. Once you withdraw the scope into the bronchus intermedius, you turn it to the uh, two o'clock procedure. Uh, you know you have to. Uh, now this 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 image is rotated, huh? Please, this this is how the carina is. Okay, this this image is rotated here. Turn to the two o'clock position. Press the tip distal to the entrance of the right upper lobe. So this is the right upper lobe. This is uh, the intermedius, and you press there, and there that's where you will get the station 11R. So that's how you identify the station 11R, and uh, it is. Uh, with the interlobar pulmonary artery, which, uh, which is also running distal. So you have the lymph node here, and you'll find the interlobar pulmonary artery distal to the, uh, to the lymph node. If there is no lymph node, you will only see the artery at that point. Now, you've done the station uh, 11, you withdraw the scope. After you withdraw the scope, you look at the, again, uh, you know, into the right main bronchus, turn the tip to the three o'clock position, and press the tip to visualize the 10R. So this is the bronchus intermediate here. This is the right upper lobe here. And at this point, you will see that that's where the uh, station uh, 10R is. Okay. This part is visualized after identifying station 7 at 9 o'clock. So what you can do, like we did, uh, you know, uh, we are used to, uh, I mean, when we did conventional TBNA, what did we do? We went down. You went to the uh, right, uh, right main bronchus, you went up to the right upper lobe, you would do the scope, and then you turned the scope, uh, you turned the wrist, and uh, so that you could puncture the seven. So just opposite the seven here, you can get the uh, uh, lymph node 10R. These are the sites where you start, but of course, once you're there, you need your subtle wrist movements to identify the lymph node, because the lymph node's enlargement is not going to... Uh, is, is not going to follow exactly what we are discussing, but these are the methods, these are the uh, steps you can do to identify these lymph nodes. So this is how the lymph node uh, will look like. Then, of course, uh, the, the most important thing for the subcarinal lymph node is very clear. You can go to the subcarinal from the right side. You can go to the subcarinal lymph node uh, uh, from the left side also. Uh, there is no problem here. So what I do is I would go into the right main bronchus. Once I go into the right main bronchus, I, and I prefer, if I have to sample a subcarinal lymph node, I, uh, you know, uh, and if there are other things, it's a diagnostic infective procedure, I like to do, prefer the subcarinal. Why? Yes, it may be easy. You get good sampling, but it is, uh, you know, uh, it is gentler on the scope. You don't have to press it, uh, you know, for the paratracheal, the way you uh, use the movements. So it's gentler on the scope. So if staging is not required, you just need a good sample. Then in my opinion, if you have a subcarinal, the subcarinal could be even smaller in size, doesn't matter. I will show you, we can do eight millimeter, 10 millimeter without any problems. So this is how uh, you do it. Now on the right side, if you go, you turn to the 12 o'clock position, 
press the tip against the right main bronchus where the main stem uh, uh, of the pulmonary artery is visualized. So you will visualize the pulmonary artery. Yeah? After confirming the Doppler mode, you turn the tip to the 9 o'clock position, visualize the station 7. The lymph node distilled to station 7 along the main bronchus is station 10. So that's what it is. 7 is first and then you have 10 which comes down there. Then you withdraw the scope into the trachea, looking straight towards the main carina, turn to 2 o'clock position. This is how we did with conventional TBNA also. We, we looked at the carina, we identified the carina, we went to the 2 o'clock position and uh, you know, depending on where the lymph node was on the CT scan, you would adjust your scope based on the distance from the carina and you would put in the, uh, uh, the needle. Similarly, you turn to the 2 o'clock position, press the tip to the proximal to the main carina, look for the SVC, look for the azygous vein. So on the right side, there you, will see, you can identify the azygous as well as the uh, SVC. Then again, now, now it comes to the uh, you know, lymph node 2R. Look at this here. The lymph node uh, 2R here is here distal uh, to the uh, brachiocephalic here. And you, can see it, uh, and you can see it here. So if you see here, the lymph node 2R is here. Uh, you, you have to just withdraw. Basically, the way I do it is, uh, whenever I do my scan is, once you've, uh, uh, I'm uh, doing the right paratracheal, I look at the right paratracheal, you go right, left, right, left, or you can come up directly in one direction, then go down and again pull up in the other direction, or you are again withdrawing, you, you've seen the paratracheal, you can turn it right, left, and you can keep on visualizing the blood vessels as well as the lymph nodes here and you will see that uh, the SVC can will bifurcate into the left and the right brachiocephalic veins. Any lymph node distal to the bifurcation on the right side is called station 2R. Why is this 2R etc important? This is only from your staging point of view. If your dominant work is diagnostic, you just need to identify the blood vessels. They help you to, you know, because if there's a lymph node which is one centimeter upstairs and you've seen on the CT scan, you just can't keep on, uh, you know, uh, fondling and doing the ultrasound in the entire trachea. You need to use the landmarks. You need to, you, you need to see where the blood vessel is, where the uh, lymph node is. Go there, identify the blood vessel, and you'll easily find the, uh, the lymph node, and that reduces your... Uh, procedure time also. So any lymph node distal the bifurcation on the right side of the trachea is station 2R. Now again you know you have to once you visualize the right brachiocephalic artery now you're looking at the lymph node 2L uh, you visualize the right brachiocephalic artery in the ultrasound image the tip is located to the 2 or 3 o'clock position in the upper trachea maintaining contact with the trachea and following the brachiocephalic artery in the ultrasound image you push the scope back down distally into the trachea and by following the brachiocephalic artery the tip will consequently be turned uh, counterclockwise that means if you follow the uh, artery you're going down here automatically uh, you will turn uh, uh, anti-clockwise and uh, at the mid trachea level at 12 o'clock position the brachiocephalic artery runs into the aortic arch now look at this here so anything above here is going to be your 2L and anything below the iota here will be your 4L. Okay, so in short, look at the blood vessels. If you find the iota, you can withdraw the scope. I mean, you know, this is practical. You withdraw the scope, you look, you can, and if you find a lymph node above the iota, you get the 2L. To me, in a very practical way, if you go down below the iota, you will find the uh, lymph node 4L. And lymph node 4L, if we go down here, if you go down here uh, uh, to look at the lymph node 4L, 4, 4 we are all used to it. The most practical way of doing it is still the way we did conventional TBNA. Take the abiscope down at the carina, you turn to the left, you oppose the lymph, uh, oppo oppose the, uh, the uh, tip to the, uh, to, to the airway, and then you identify clearly the iota, you identify the pulmonary artery, and then in between you will find the uh, you will find here, look, clearly look at this here. You have the pulmonary artery down here, you have the iota here approximately, and you have the lymph node 4L here. So this is how, uh, where the lymph node 4L is placed, and this is how the anatomy is, pulmonary artery. And as you want to go and look into the now, if you want to go down to look at 10L, you have to just follow the pulmonary artery down. You follow the pulmonary artery down here, on, in, in the left main bronchus, then you will come across the lymph node 10L. Okay, that's how you do it. Now, lymph node uh, 11L is very sim you know, is easier than the 12L. 12L can be very tricky sometimes. The scope may not go into the segment to get 12L sometimes. But uh, 11L is quite easier. Upper lobe, lower lobe bronchus, and often you just put the uh, 
put the scope at this uh, bifurcation here and you will see the lymph node here and the distal here, interloba pulmonary artery here. So this is the way, again for 12L, you advance the scope further down into the basal segments, uh, the segmental bronchus or the upper low bronchus station and here you can get the 12L. But to me sometimes I find that 12L can be a bit uh, uh, tricky and not so easy to get, uh, particularly if you have short statured people. So now we've done that quickly. I will uh, take a few cases before the second bell rings. A 58 year old gentleman, uh, you know, who underwent all CT guided biopsies, everything here, because this was, uh, the, you know, the lesion here for peripheral lesion. Yes, you should do a, a peripheral CT guided image guided biopsy here. That was negative, only necrotic tissue. PET scan shows only the central areas have lit up here. And then clearly uh, we went ahead, we did a biopsy here, many, uh, this is, yeah. And if you look at this, and if you look at this here, the, I, I want to show that you know, even if it is a sub-centimeter lymph node, up to 8 millimeters, you can do it. You know, this is a 5 millimeter scale here. 5 millimeter scale, you drop a line here, you drop a line here. This is a sub-centimeter lymph node, it's about 8 millimeters. And you know, you can get enough material here to get even immunohistochemistry here. So that's done. So this is one paper. I'll quickly show you a few papers, our Indian data. Uh, where you can get a lot of these scores, all these scores, they, these scores can be blood admixed also. So some, what we do is we send the entire thing uh, to the pathologist and then they can take the course and we tell them, you know, uh, we uh, tell them not to throw away the uh, remaining bit and they can use the remaining bit for a cell block also. So these are the cores which you can get and uh, with this, the, in 85% patients of in, my pra in our practice we published, you can get cores, diagnostic yield is 89% in our, I mean, and this was in 2016. So this we did with Yasufuku and uh, you know, I will not go into the details of this, but quickly I want to show you. in. Patients where you suspect TB, depending on which area you are, you can clearly get this pus. This was also shown earlier on. You can get pus aspirates into the lymph node, fine. In this particular case, she, this, this patient was pan-sensitive on cultures. But there's no way looking at the lymph node you can say ki whether it is a pan-sensitive or it is an MDR. This is another 40-year-old female, multiple antibiotics, no response, and the, the TB culture showed MDR TB, not possible. So you really need even now to we go ahead and we counsel individual patients very well before they choose empiric treatment. If empiric treatment is chosen, it is documented that all the other options have been given. And you go ahead, this is the paper which we published in many years ago now, three years ago in the ERJ. And this is the first paper about uh, the role of EBUS tBNA in rapid microbiological diagnosis of drug resistant uh, mediastinal adenopathy. So clearly, as I said, in EBUS, in, uh, in our setting, it's very important and we can, it's very useful to diagnose MDR TB, maybe it may be gene expert, it's culture, sometimes gene expert is positive, culture is negative, sometimes gene expert is negative, culture is positive, all possible combinations are there, but yes, it helps to make a diagnosis. And again, this quickly I want to show you uh, is a patient who had a, a mass here uh, and it was uh, uh, on the, uh, behind the airway, behind the soft wall, of the uh, beyond the uh, posterior wall of the trachea. It was not easy for the gastro somehow to do the biopsy. So they sent it to us. And this is an interesting case I put here. Okay, last slide. So you can see here, there is a bulge here. And then we wanted to, we just turned, uh, we went ahead with the EBUS here. And uh, you see on white line, there's the bulge on the posterior wall, this is fine. And then here, you clearly, we could see the bulge here. So this is, this EBUS was done, of course, in discussion. This was a doctor's father, so there was no problem in the counseling. And uh, we went ahead and we did uh, EBUS to the posterior wall. Okay, not done routinely, but yes, uh, it can be done. That was done many years ago, almost 10 years ago now and uh, we got a diagnosis of squamous cell carcinoma for this particular patient also. So what I've done is I've not gone into the complex anatomy because there are, I have seen some sessions in workshops where you discuss, you identify blood vessels, branches and all. No, what is important in practice? First step is you should know your landmarks on how to perform EBUS and that's how you want to. When I want to look at the mediastinum in the, for the EBUS, I, look, I want to look at the lymph nodes and I want to separate them out. Once that is mastered and then you want to do transvascular, etc. Yes, the next step is yes, you need to identify all the blood vessels and uh, it's very uh, important from a practice point of view. Thank you very much. This is so great to see that the EBUS is uh, advancing uh, <coughs> in our city or in our state. Uh, 
Amit has asked me to talk about the optimizing the yield, which is a little uh, different topic. I think the, the Prashant and the Amit both uh, have done a pretty good job of explaining the EBUS, so I probably may skip few of the slides, which may have a reputation in interest of the time. So 60-year-old uh, female smoker with a shortness of breath, uh, this is a CT scan, shows a 1.7 centimeter lymph node, uh, left upper lobe lymph node and nodule in the <coughs> mediastinum. As you can see, I think all of you guys are familiar now with the anatomy Prashant has elaborated very nicely. Right paratracheal, left paratracheal, periaortic. So I have a question for you guys. Which lymph node uh, you should biopsy first with EBUS if the on-site evaluation or rose is available? Which one will you biopsy, either lymph node or the nodule, if a rose is available? A, B, C, D, A for the left paratracheal, B for the periaortic, C for the right paratracheal or the D for the left upper lobe nodule. What do you guys think? Four R. Okay. Yep. I think that's probably the correct answer. That the which one will, uh, because we if you are doing it for the staging and diagnosis both together, I guess if you do a right four R and the four R shows the malignancy, probably you will be able to understand this is the N3 limb node because it's a contralateral. So I think EBUS is useful as the previous speakers mentioned uh, for the diagnosis and the, the staging of a lung cancer, which we are all aware of. My role is basically to explain how can we get the more yield. So again, I probably will skip few of these slides. Uh, most of you guys are familiar with the EBUS, the scope and the technique. So I'll probably skip this thing in the interest of the time. Uh, again, I think this is straight away from the Olympus how people can do EBUS. But Once uh, a lymph node station is targeted for biopsy, an ultrasound image must be obtained. In order to obtain an ultrasound image, the ultrasound transducer must be coupled to the airway wall. Achieve coupling through direct contact between the tip of the bronchoscope and the airway wall, or couple the saline-filled balloon with the airway wall. If suboptimal coupling occurs, reverberation artifact may be seen. To correct, adjust position or carefully add more saline into the balloon. Once the ultrasound image is obtained, ensure that the EBUS scope is in neutral position prior to insertion of the Olympus Visishot EBUS TBNA needle. Then, insert the needle through the working channel and secure the needle on the scope. Push the connecting slider to the lock position until it clicks. Unlock the sheath adjuster knob and adjust the sheath to be visualized in the endoscopic view. Tighten the screw. Next, flex the scope to re-engage with the airway wall and locate target area on the ultrasound image. Release the needle adjuster and advance needle into the target. Remove the stylet and attach the prepared syringe on the aspiration port. Turn the stopcock on the syringe to the parallel position to apply suction. Move the needle slider back and forth in the target area several times. When finished, release suction by turning the stopcock 90 degrees and remove the syringe from the aspiration port. Retract the needle into the sheath until it clicks. Push the lever to lock the needle adjuster. Place the scope in neutral position. Release the connecting slider to unlock the needle from the scope and remove. Repeat this process several times at each target and remove the bronchoscope from the body at the... So what are the factors which can increase the yield? So I made this kind of a schema, uh, size of the needle and the type of the needle. And I think that was a question was asked. So I will show you some of the data. Is there a difference between a different size of the needle for the yield or the knot? 
Second is availability of a rose. I guess that was also discussed and we will try to understand if that makes a difference in the yield. Third is the number of the passes. How many passes uh, or samples you want to, to consider for the adequate for the diagnosis. Fourth is the indication of the EBUS itself. Like what you are doing the EBUS for. Are you doing it for sarcoidosis versus tuberculosis versus lymphoma versus malignancy. All will have a different preset yield. The type of anesthesia or a sedation and the finally the most important part is operator expertise. You know they always say that the what is the most important part of the stethoscope and we say the part between the two earpieces, the part which is here. So the operator expertise is certainly very important uh, to get the better yield. So let's look at a one thing at a time. For example, size of the needle. So this was a, one of the recent meta-analysis uh, published in the Journal of International Pulmonology and Blanc uh, Broncolo uh, Broncology and Pulmonology. So for example, there are five or six different studies they compared. I'm trying to find out the, uh, okay. So there are five different studies they compared between the size 21 and 22. And as you can see that the, some of the studies are retrospective and one study was a randomized controlled trial. What they found that the yield as far as the size, I mean needle 21 and 22 are considered, absolutely did not create any difference in the yield. The yield was more or less similar between the 21 and 22. So as Prashant mentioned that the, whatever the needle you have available, I think you should probably use it. This recent needle came into the picture, uh, the 19 gauge, I think uh, available in US for the last maybe three or four years uh, and we are routinely using it nowadays. So this was another paper recently uh, compared between the, and this was published again in the, the job uh, in 2021, then comparison was between the 19 gauge and 21 gauge. As you can see that almost, uh, you know, the, six, the, the same kind of a path of, uh, pathologies. Uh, on, on an average, the 4.1 passes in the both the group. Diagnostic yield is similar between 19 and the 21, absolutely no difference. 89% versus 88%, so absolutely no significant difference. As far as the smear cellularity was considered, the smear cellularity was, uh, smear cellularity was more in the 19 gauge. But if you are able to get the diagnosis finally, why, why there should be a difference. In fact, as Prashant mentioned, we have also experienced that 19 gauge needle has a more blood contamination. So not necessarily every time the higher gauge needle is better. There is another paper recently came this year in 2022. I mean, sorry, this year is now the new year, but the new, uh, the last year, the, there is a new needle came, which is a 25 gauge needle. I don't know it's available in India or not, but there is a comparison of 21 versus 25. And again, you can say that the adequacy was still similar. The yield was similar. So I think between 19, 21, 22, and 25, I think there is absolutely no difference. So whatever you are comfortable with, I guess you can use the needle. I don't think that the needle itself makes any difference. It's operator expertise probably is the better situation rather than the, rather than the needle. What about cryobiopsy? Again, Prashant touched on that, and this was a cryobiopsy <coughs> between the 21, I mean, so they, what they did, they, in a one arm, they did only the, the TBNA, in other part, they did a TBNA plus cryobiopsy, and you can see that the cryobiopsy definitely did, uh, created a more or the better yield, and the p-value was significantly different. Again, Prashant mentioned that, I don't know the, you guys do routine cryobiopsy, or the, as you mentioned in a few patients, that's what the same situation in the U.S. that the, we only do in a few patients, not, not routinely, but, Time may come that this may become a routine situation. Uh, this is the only promising thing as far as the type of a needle or as far as the size of the needle is considered. Uh, so this is again the same thing. If you do, Now, what about a forcep biopsy? I haven't done that myself, by the way. So these are just the data uh, from the University of Chicago or from the Team Murgus group. Uh, so there are six observational studies with the 443 patients. So in a one group, they only did an EBUS TBNA. On the other group, they did an EBUS with uh, IFB, which is the intranodal forcep biopsy. Again, I'm not sure whether that is available or not, but you can see that with the forcep, the, the, the yield was significantly different compared to the pure EBUS, 67% versus 92%. Now again, remember, these studies are not blinded and cannot be blinded. So there is a definitely a, some biased situation going to come if you have a forcep. So 
if you are doing a, the ebus for the sarcoid or a, or a lymphoma i guess it may make a difference but for a pure cancer diagnosis this may not make a difference because their yield on a pure ebus tbna was significantly lower remember it's not only that this yield was higher of 92% but the prashan showed that the, their yield is 82% or 85% so if i compare 85% versus 90% there may not be a statistically significant p-value. But if I compare 67% and 90%, there might be a statistical p-value. So depending on the what is a diagnosis intended, your yield may change. Now, uh, he asked a very legitimate question, and this is what I was believing until this paper or until this recommendation came. So rapid on-site cytologic evaluation improves accuracy of TBNA. What do you guys think? True or false? True? Everyone believes it's true? Actually, it's not true. The, again, according to the studies, I was also believing the same exact thing, but after the, you know, COVID, the staff in the pathology department is significantly reduced, so we are also facing the same problem. So every time we don't have a rose anymore, which used to be a scenario before, but these are the data from a five randomized control trial. So very interesting, uh, uh, the consideration here, not the retrospective data. So five controlled randomized trial with a 620 patients, and they said that there is no added benefit of rose. The needle passes significantly fewer, because if a rose person is going to come and tell you that, okay, I found the small cell, or I found the non-small cell, then you are not going to torture the further lymph nodes, which is obvious, but the ultimate diagnosis yield, as far as the yield is considered, was not at all different between the rows, with rows or without rows. So these are a control studies and they did not find any difference. So the procedure time was also not different. I was thinking that at least if I do a one lymph node versus three different lymph nodes, procedure time should be different, right? Isn't it? I mean, all of us do and it's a long time consuming procedure. But they found that even the procedure time was similar between the both the groups. So I think from the evidence-based consideration, there is no difference in a rows. And so the chest guideline from 2016, I think that is the latest guideline we have available for the EBUS. And they mentioned that the EBUS sampling can be performed with or without rows, and it's a class 1C evidence. So I think that's a pretty decent evidence that, that there is no need for a rows and uh, uh, anything else. The third part is the number of passes. How many passes or how many stations should you lymph node if you want to consider the negative diagnosis of malignancy or any other thing? What do you guys think? One to two, three to four, or five to six? How many lymph node stations you can sample? Suppose if there are more than three, four stations are enlarged on the CT scan. Yeah, I think three to four is the possible reasonable answer because as you can see in this uh, one of the meta-analysis, for example, this is possibly for the cancer, the sensitivity, which is the yield, the in a one pass, again, I'm trying to use my cursor here. To, 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 okay. If you do a one pass, the sensitivity, so the positivity or yield was 70%, second pass 83%, third pass 95%, fourth pass 95%. So after the third and a fourth pass, the yield did not exponentially increase. So they said that the three or possibly four passes are more than adequate. If you are going to get a diagnosis, you are going to get in this. We have seen some of the thoracic surgeon or some of the endoscopies, like seven different stations or again and again they will do come back to the same station and then biopsy again and again i don't think that is required uh, from the evidence-based medicine standpoint it's like probably three or four what about the indi i mean i think the prashant again mentioned and then as far as the staging part is considered this guidelines have different i mean they have changed the game differently so ebus if fna has a significant sensitivity and specificity ebus tbna also is the same thing and again, I'm not going to go in the detail of this one, but the, this is yielding, this is causing now a better yield than our conventional CT or the PET staging. So the EBUS staging almost become a standard of the care now. Uh, I think all of you guys are familiar with it. Now, optimizing the yield for a lymphoma, for example, the definitely the sensitivity is only 57%. So the lymphoma, one in every other case you can diagnose. So again, with what Prashant mentioned, that's what again we do. The first pass, we do it on a slide, and whatever the rest, rest material, we will do some, you know, the fluid and collect in the, the, collect in the formalin, and then send it for a flow cytometry if we are th suspecting the uh, right away. 
and the flow cytometry sample needs to be put in the flow material immediately or within the next you know 10 5 or 10 minutes otherwise the immune molecules that's what i have heard i am not a pathologist but they always tell us to add the material in the flow cytometry sample uh, the tube immediately uh, again if you are doing the these are multiple studies which have shown the similar situation about the the when the pre suspected or the pre-test diagnosis was lymphoma the yield was around 67 uh, percent the which is different than the yield for the malignancy or yield for the staging so depending on the what is your pre-test diagnosis the yield is going to be different what about sarcoidosis i don't know the, how many sarcoid cases you do you see but we do see a lot of sarcoid cases and the sarcoid happens typically in african-american population which we have a lot so the sarcoid cases again the yield is the 85 percent uh, to show non-caseating granuloma the passes here are little different for example your yield here is all the way up to the plateau is reaching after the level of five or six so if i am suspecting sarcoidosis and if we don't have a rose then we may go from four or five different lymph node station not for malignancy the chase guideline also says that in patient with suspected sarcoidosis uh, with a mediastinal lymphadenopathy the ebus tbna should be used as a first line tool for the diagnosis the problem is that if you have a fibrotic lymph node like amit was saying that if we have a resistance and if we are thinking it's a fibrotic or a stone like lymph node that's a problem you won't be able to pierce the needle and in fact you will have a very high chance of the breaking the scope which is very expensive problem so what you can do along with it and this is one of the important table i teach my fellows all the time that if you do a transbronchial uh, biopsy with endobronchial biopsy the yield is almost 33 to 80 percent if you do ebus tbna plus transbronchial plus endobronchial all three even if you don't see any lesion in the endobronchial situation and you do do endobronchial biopsy the yield for a sarcoid is very high the generalized yield for a transbronchial biopsy even without a significant involvement of lung is anywhere ranging between 60 to 70 percent so anyway you are doing endoscopy why not to do the transbronchial and endobronchial and tbna all three together probably your yield will significantly increase for sarcoidosis if the pre-test diagnosis is sarcoidosis the same thing uh, i think the you guys are seeing way lot many tuberculosis than us but for a tuberculosis also the sensitivity is pretty high and when i say sensitivity as again the prashant mentioned uh, you know you can send it for the the zil nelson stain or the culture or the the you know the the staining for the multi drug resistance what about a sedation type you guys do ebus under general anesthesia or the local i mean the conscious sedation moderate sedation wow that's interesting the the we do a lot of general anesthesia compared to what is recommended so that's a kind of a wrong practice so moderate sedation versus the you know mac is a general i mean the monitored anesthesia so the diagnostic yield is similar whether you do uh, under the general versus the local the diagnostic yield is more or less same the the difference the or a negative predictive value or the sensitivity are the same the only problem actually the general anesthesia is exponentially increase the cost which is not a right thing to do so if the you can do under the moderate sedation or some deep sedation i think that is uh, that is pretty preferable situation rather than general anesthesia the last part is operator expertise as i mentioned that the most important part is operator expertise so these are two different studies which have actually understood the operator expertise the one is uh, on the you know the solid line and the other one is uh, the dotted line and you can see that the when the people are reaching to the number around 61 to 80 then there is a, some plateau type of situation comes of course if you have done a 200 that is definitely better than the 100 definitely better than 50 but what is an optimum number people should do before they are certified and so based on those observational studies ats ers and accp all have a uniform recommendations that the before you consider somebody who is a competent at least 40 to 50 procedures they have done and then every year they should continue to perform 20 procedures to maintain their competency so again not everyone follows this type of recommendation in the competency based medical education 
but these are the some numbers arbitrary numbers came out from these studies that after that the people have a plateauing uh, for the uh, for the expertise so i will say thank you very much these are all the factors which will increase the yield regarding continuation of this hotness this is my first slide so i have a same question during my college life also should i give it should i don't give it because the title is same ross so i was positive at that time also and i am positive today also ross should we do it or should we not not do it okay so what is the need for pathological diagnosis particularly in mediastinum so we have a broad spectrum of mediastinal lesions presenting with similar sign and symptoms with similar radiological features false positive results in radiology are very common so we need a final pathological tissue diagnosis for a crucial which is very crucial for planning of uh, treatment as well as the staging of the cancer so how will you people help us so we have uh, some traditional diagnostic methods uh, which are non invasive or minimally invasive which are still gold standard like exfoliative cytology all sputum bronchial brushing washing pleural fluid all this trans bronchial needle aspiration and ct guided fnac fnab if they will not give you answer then there will be a traditionally there will be a surgical that is uh, mediastinoscopy and thoracoscopy but as the beginning of the sessions we are know the newer technique is ebus and all this advantage i will not justify myself if i will say all these advantages in front of you all uh, renowned pulmonologists but we know the ebus is a very good procedure and uh, we have all the advantages so coming to my topic what is the definition of ross so rapid on site evaluation or ross is a service that pathologist and cytotechnologist commonly perform to check the cellular content and adequacy of the ebus tbna material it is also known as a frozen section in ebus procedure i i think all of you know frozen section is the surgeon gives us some material intra operatively when patient is on the operation uh, table they will give us some material will diagnose in minutes and on that basis they will go for the further extent of the surgery so like that the ebus uh, in ebus uh, we can use the ross okay so what is the general uh, uh, flow of uh, ross so initially initial pass after getting the initial pass they will take the material on the slides some of the slides they will uh, air dry and some of the slide they will do fixation in uh, alcohol the air dry slide they will go for diff quick stain and toluidine blue stain on that toluidine blue stain which is we generally perform it's a 30 second stain only so on that basis uh, we will do uh, adequacy of the uh, sample if adequacy is there we can also try to get some diagnostic evaluation whether some granulomas or any malignant material if on initial pass we have some good answer about adequacy and diagnostic material the further pass they can take into the cell block or or for biopsy material if my initial diagnostic evaluation is granuloma they can go and collect the more material in the uh, microbiology if i will say i have a doubt of lymphoma they can take a material in flow cytometry collecting material and if the adequacy or the cellularity is low they can go for additional pass and give me the once again they can give me the uh, slides for ross so uh, this is the basic protocol in my favor it is a important aspect for ebus now what are the expectation from the uh, cytopathologist during ross so whether the samples are adequate whether if adequate they are benign or malignant if malignant then the the material is sufficient to say final diagnosis and sub classification on hp final hp or on cell block but it is not uh, possible in all the cases it can be difficult why because there is a no adequacy criteria is not fixed there are wide varieties of mediastinal lung and uh, lesions which can be dif very difficult to define whether it is benign or malignant we all know there is some contamination on needles 
reuse needles there is a contamination bronchial contamination is again a very important in case of reactive changes in the bronchial lining it is difficult to say whether they are uh, malignant or a reactive and obviously i cannot do all the ancillary studies on ross uh, slides uh, there is a, some guideline for adequacy criteria see whenever we have ross and uh, it doesn't look good if we just say uh, it is only blood it is only blood so that doesn't look good so they have invented one sco scoring system for lymph node and parenchymal lung lesion the if there is a presence of diagnostic material it is adequate whether it is malignant cell or granuloma for both whether it is for lymph node or whether it is for parenchymal lung lesion if diagnostic material is there it is adequate but if diagnostic granuloma malignant cells are not there then for lymph node the scoring system is this is on high power if less than 40 then i will score 0 41 to 200 it will be score 1 more than 200 with no confluent clusters of lymphoid cell that will be uh, stage uh, score 2 and confluent with germinal cell and confluent seeds and more than 200 cell it will be score 3 in case of parenchymal lung disease, in the presence of alveolar macrophages or anthracotic pigment, the samples are adequate. So in this slide, you can see it is a predominantly blood with very scattered lymphoid cells, which is score zero. You can see some, uh, some cells, some more than 40. So this is score one. This is score two, four to 20, which some clusters are there. In this, there are anthracotic pigments with some lymphoid cells in the background. These are granulomas on uh, uh, diff quick stain and then on this is on routine stain. And these are some malignant cells which considered to be adequate smears. In cell block sections, we have a, uh, this is blood mix, but these all are cellular elements. On high power, you can see there are uh, malignant cells. Sometimes it happens, even though I say ROS is adequate for malignant cells, and we unfortunately we didn't get material in cell block. Very rarely, but it happens. And if cell block is cellular, I can go for my further immunohistochemistry and further uh, study, prognostic and diagnostic. Yeah. So in general, what interpretation we can give you on the basis of uh, ROS is positive for malignant, negative for malignant cells, if adequacy is good granulomatous inflammation, non-specific inflammation, and inconclusive if the score is uh, zero or one. So coming to, in my thought, the potential benefits of the ROS at three level. One is diagnostic at process level and ancillary studies. The diagnostic is whether I, I, will, I will say about the adequacy, the smears are adequate. The diagnostic yield we can increase definitely with the help of the uh, ROS. The accuracy is comparable with the final HP diagnosis. And uh, this is, I am sure this must be an uh, advantage in all the clinician will agree. Immediate feedback to patient. You can give some immediate feedback to patient also. So process, uh, number of paths we can minimize. Number of sites, you can change the uh, site of the, uh, your lymph node. The procedure's time and resources we can decrease. The cost, unnecessary, unne uh, ancillary studies, you can, uh, no need to send some unnecessary uh, ancillary studies. And you can uh, repeat procedure chances is also less if you done the ROS and you have a final diagnosis. If after finishing the ROS and finally the report is come inconclusive, you have to repeat the procedure. And obviously uh, ancillary study guidance is the one of the uh, potential benefit on the basis of ROS, you can choose whether to send more material for immunohistochemistry, for molecular. If it is a lymphoma, you can send it for flow cytometry. And if I have said the granulomas, you can send it for gene expert and uh, further uh, culture study. So diagnostic accuracy in compared to final HP, it is very good. In compared to specificity and positive predictive value, it is almost near to 100% in compared to ROST with the final HP. Still, it is so many advantages there. Why we are not using this is uh, so commonly? 
because you need an experience on site cytopathologist we can take which, which have a experience and familiarity with the diagnosis and which can take a call the, in minutes it is a very important the time is the very important factor so that they can have to take the, some quick decisions sometime it happens that equivocal on site diagnosis may prematurely end a procedure there will be a need for extra time for the cytopathologist will take definitely 2 to 3 minutes at least to give uh, you the uh, opinion and that time will be there financial under compensation of the pathologist time which is not that much in the india but usa yeah definitely the pathologist are very highly paid and this is this will be there need for optimal slide staining quality extended type of procedure as well as the extending anesthesia time higher doses of narcotics and there will be a need of optimal clinical and pathologist communication time means we have all the clinical details earlier because the ROS we have to take a very quick call so we need all the clinical and imaging details which is sometimes we didn't get and there will be a ROS station which has to be nearby or very inside the scopy room uh, consultant time and resource majority of the time we are not performing the ROS just because we can't uh, adjust the all the three whether it is cytopathologist whether it is endoscopist or whether a scopy room the three things should be uh, free at the same time so the comfort zone of either side when pulmonologist is free cytopathologist is not free scopy room is not free and this is the biggest disadvantage and sometimes we lost the specimen uh, we lost the material in the slide so that we can use it in the biopsy and the molecular material so the doctor tony maddox west hartford sign hospital nhs trust has stated one very bold statement if institute or physician adequacy rate is less than 75 percentage ROS is recommended and if the adequacy rate is more than 75 percentage then it is okay so what is the ROS future so as the doctor arpan said the ROS there should be a ROS team and we can train this is the basic thing and we can train our cytopathologist our cytotechnologist even endoscopist or radiologist for performing the ROS they can perform with a good amount of good duration of training in future and uh, currently also we use ROS in EUS also and in the future some minimally invasive uh, method like FNSE bronchial brushing then CT guided FNSE and also touch imprints of biopsy we can use ROS in the future so if we can establish a ROS station and if we can train any of this uh, uh, person from the ROS team we can uh, minimize the most important drawback of the uh, ROS that is unavailability of the or mismatch of the time the comfortness of the clinicians with the pathologist that we can minimize if we establish this basic setup in our uh, premises but training is definitely required because uh, as you can see this signet ring cell adenocarcinoma is there but some inexperienced pathologists yes, or inexperienced can Gentle do this is a sir. okay yes, Yeah, so the take home message ROS is had a very high sensitivity specificity and diagnostic accuracy for granulomatous and malignant lesion when compared to final diagnosis and ROS is simple highly efficacious procedure that is able to provide an immediate accurate diagnosis for the rapid clinical decision making for both granulomas as well as malignant cases. Thank you. Uh, you know, uh, there were there was a discussion about uh, which Amit spoke to me, malignancy, you know, uh, central airway obstruction treatment, a role of IP, malignancy benign. So we said we'll combine it. Okay. So uh, I try not to, I try to keep you alert for the next half an hour. So this is a paper which we did some years ago. And, uh, you know, this paper was done with the whole idea that uh, you can have uh, you know, whenever you have a non-small cell lung cancer and you have an endobronchial obstruction,
that that individual has a very bad prognosis. You know, even the chemotherapy trials, you know, when they look, they if you have, if you read the fine print, all the earlier chemotherapy trials, if you have endobronchial obstruction, that patient is excluded because they don't know what will be the outcome, there will be post-obstructive pneumonia, etc. So the question is, if you have a patient who is advanced lung cancer, has no endobronchial obstruction, and the other is endobronchial obstruction which you can treat, you can treat with interventional pulmonological methods, will they have a similar outcome? And I think now this becomes more and more important because the game, I mean, this is in 2006. And in 2006, we showed that if you have only chemotherapy, radiotherapy as options, the, I will show you the data, the, the outcome is similar. But now in the last five, seven years, the game has completely changed. So in this, we comp did a very simple comparison. Patients with advanced cancer, no airway obstruction. And in the other group, there was airway obstruction that was treated with lasers, stents, etc. Group A, Group B, I mean those times we were talking about cisplatin, carboplatin or a third generation chemotherapy agent. And what we showed here is that there is no difference in survival. That means if somebody has an advanced lung cancer, you would treat that with uh, uh, laser or cautery and stent and then give them chemotherapy, they would behave like as if they did not have airway obstruction. So this gives an advantage, this gives, uh, you know, uh, us a platform that we, IP procedure should not be denied. Of course, there are rules about how much will be the, how much the extent of obstruction, how much will be the, uh, you know, uh, what is the expected survival, what are the morbidities, all that is there. But the platform is there and now there was a recent paper did exactly the same uh, study and have a similar outcome. So when we talk about therapeutic modalities, all these things we know, there are laser, cautery, cryo, dilatation stent. Laser is very expensive. Yes, I use diode laser. I will try, put in some cases for that. But otherwise, NDIAC laser, YAP laser, all that is just not feasible in this country. Although I will show you a case of uh, YAG laser. So you have to identify the type of airway stenosis. If you have an endobronchial lesion, clearly you will debulk it. If you have an extrinsic compression, you have to be extremely careful. If you have just a luminal, you know, a mucosal lesion, you have to be very careful about, uh, you know, um, uh, about uh, doing any uh, burn using a hot therapy there. So you treat the intraluminal, and uh, then if you, if there is after treating the uh, intraluminal. Uh, component if you think that the wall is floppy only then I would put in a stent and now we've started to use lesser and lesser stents because you know if the outcome is better now the outcome for lung cancer is pretty good and therefore to put in a foreign body at the outset you should one you know one has to be very careful because the stent will come with more problems you know it is not that you put in a stent 10 years ago, 15 years ago, it was a different story. We knew the median survival was 9 months, 12 months, and the, before the stent, uh, the patient wouldn't survive to see the stent problems. Now the game is different. So just want to show you, uh, you know, how the laser, some of the, one of, one of the earlier cases, you see here, this is a rigid bronchoscopy, and uh, I will try to move this further. And then you see, uh, in this case, the idea of doing, uh, you know, this is a, uh, non-contact laser. This is a YAG laser. So in this uh, ND YAG. So in this case, what is the the principle remains the same. One has to uh, address the point where the lesion is attached to the airway wall. That's how one has to do. And here, what we would do is in a non-contact form, the laser is fired at the base. You devascularize it, and then after you devascularize it, you can core the lesion here. Okay. So uh, this is how it is. This is now, this is where it is joint here. So you can clearly see a non-contact laser. I think NDIAG laser is, uh, the laser is superb because it's very precise. With cautery, you will see, you know, you touch here and there, you can cause more uh, broader uh, uh, burning here. Okay, once this is done here, what you can do next step is you go in and, oh, sorry, here, yeah, yeah. once this is done, you can see here, you core the tumor and with the forceps, you can just pull it out. And clearly you would see here, in the interest of time, I go here down. Now it's completely open. Now one would decide here, 
about putting in a stent. So stent putting was more fashionable then. That time you had to support the airway and the patient would have a whatever a survival of you know months and would be lucky to uh, reach a year or so. <clears throat> in our practice here, I think uh, cautery can be used very optimally. Okay, so I'll show you some cases for the cautery also. So now this is a case. You know, now this is a case, uh, uh, and uh, this patient had this lesion for quite some time. And what you see here is I'll just for demonstration purposes. I like to inject uh, some adrenaline at the base. Okay, and then you can see uh, this is a big lesion here. You can put a snare around uh, this lesion. So now th the earlier case I did with uh, was shown with a rigid one of the earlier cases I did. This is now done through a. You know, at this point, the rigid somehow was not available. So we've done this case, I, if I remember correctly, through the uh, through a large uh, endotracheal tube. Okay, so everything is possible. And then you see a very with a lot of difficulty, we are trying to uh, uh, get to the base. It's extremely important to get to the base properly, not to be in a rush to try and start cautery because you can't get to the base. You will have to cut through the tumor. Okay, that takes a lot of time. That increases the bleeding risk also. So you've got to the base and after you get to the base yes you can uh, you can go ahead and uh, yeah you can see it's been it is burning and then it completely I'm not sure why it's not moving further and then you know with uh, yeah this is an endotracheal tube yeah so large endotracheal tube we did this and f so uh, in this intervention could be done even without a rigid so stents, we use stents in malignancy. We always uh, said, yes, you can very easily use a metal stent. Patient will not survive for the complications. Okay, that was the approach. And uh, we've uh, used a lot of these metal stents in the past. We published in those years, 2008, long-term outcome of uh, ultraflex stents in airway stenosis, complete follow-up, you know, uh, very good results. The benefit, this is a very important uh, diagram here. So this is showing the number of stents that were put across various lesions. So the difference between using a Dumont stent and a metal stent here is you can put this through various diameters, you know, from uh, right main to going to intermediate, intermediate is going to lower, you can put it into the left main because the metallic stent will curve. That is the advantage of using this. <coughs> We've also done this, uh, use, you know, people always, whenever you use rigid bronchoscopy, the, uh, the silicone stents come into a discussion. So when you talk about uh, the discussion of the silicone stents, then the question is, when should one use a silicone stent? When should one use a, uh, a, 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 a metallic stent in malignant patients? So this is a data where the, a few of us operators decided you know which stent to use again it was operator dependent the operator decided which stent to put and eventually if you see the thought process what went behind is if there is an intrinsic lesion only what is an intrinsic lesion that you've got an intramural lesion you've removed it and you feel that yes you need to support the airway uh, you know you, you could put in this is a Dumont stent okay you could put in a Dumont stent if there is an extrinsic plus in, in a extrinsic lesion you put in a ultra flex stent here this is the ultra flex stent here that means if the, you want a ex, radial expansal force, if you feel there's an intrinsic plus extrinsic lesion, again, the choice was automatically for a extra, uh, uh, for a metallic stent so that you get a radial expansal force. So the, whenever you want a radial expansal force, you would go in for a metal stent. Now, if you think the outcome of the patient is going to be good and your intervention is only temporary, you may want to remove a stent, you should try and put in a silicone stent and if you can't do that at least a fully covered stent so that there is not a too much of granulation in growth uh, or tumor in growth and making it difficult for you to remove it later on these are the various complications you can see with the demonstrations i will not go uh, into the uh, uh, complications of the, these stents in interest of time but what can you expect you can expect uh, restenosis mucus plugging stent migration granulation tissue all these problems are there so it's not just enough to be able to put in a stent one should be even geared to tackle the complications so this is an example of a so, uh, sorry uh, uh, example of a Dumont stent here uh, this Dumont stent was uh, put in here in a very in this lesion this is sitting just into the right main bronchus here 
and now uh, this is a polyflex tent. We stopped using the polyflex tents because they fracture too much, but this is a Y polyflex tent. So we discussed about malignancy, laser, electrocautery, uh, and how you can use it through either a rigid or through a flexible scope. Now, tracheoesophageal fistula, often seen, you know, uh, you know uh, I mean, advanced patients have advanced disease. This is one of, the, I always show this, my first uh, patient where I diagnosed with tracheoesophageal fistula. At that time, we used to use the vascular stents, wall stents, covered wall stents. And so in this patient, we had put in a covered wall stent, okay? And uh, this is what uh, it, it, it looked like for a TO fistula. And this is uh, the uh, image intensifier image. So these are wall stents. So the whole journey started with wall stents. And from wall stents, we migrated then to the ultraflex stents, the nitinol stents. Now, <clears throat> this is a patient uh, who has uh, this uh, lesion here. He's got malignancy. He can't lie down. And now, um, how do you tackle this? And the, when we did the imaging, in the imaging, it shows that the lesion is going from the trachea, going all the way, also compressing the left main bronchus uh, significantly, and also a little bit of the carina. So in such a patients, now we have uh, uh, available here the Y stents. So this is a Y stent which can be used in, uh, in such patients. I, I, use, I, I used the rigid bronchoscopy and image intensifier too deploy the stent if you have the small scopes during the along with the deployment catheter you can put the now the small scopes also to check how it is deploying but one has to be extremely uh, careful with this you know sometimes these stents don't open <laughs> and then you should be prepared to remove them you have very limited time and that's where the rigid bronchoscopy is coming to the rescue okay so if you do through a flexible and if you don't if the stent doesn't open and, just, and I say this because this happened with me uh, then you have few few little time to remove it and put another one so yeah so this is how the and, and if it works it works really brilliant look at the, in this patient completely you've, you've got a complete artificial airway here these are the threads here which you can use sometimes to adjust the stent uh, if required but typically they would st uh, with the technique which you use going from the left main and coming up they will fit in quite snugly on the carina. Now, this is a patient who has a 62-year-old male, advanced CA esophagus, had previous esophageal stenting done, and now comes, has breathlessness since one month, and attributed to advanced cancer, and now has in stridor. Now, very important thing, you know, we often have seen patients who've got a big esophageal mask, you put in the esophageal stent, the, the esophagus lumen improves, but it is compressing the airway very commonly known often if it is a lower mass it will go and even obstruct only the left main bronchus and if it's major it goes to the lower part of the trachea and it, it can obstruct the uh, uh, left main bronchus and the lower trachea so this is what it is clearly you can see here look at this ct this is the esophageal stent here and you can clearly see the complete narrowing at the level of the carina complete narrowing uh, and of the left main bronchus also and you you see up here you know a complete uh, narrowing also of the uh, airway lumen here, such a narrow airway lumen here. So in this patient also, you know, we, we put in a Y stent here in this particular patient because uh, there was a, a, a compromise in the left main bronchus, compromise at the level of the carina and also on the lower part of the trachea. And what you can clearly see are two stents here. On one hand side, you see the esophageal stent here and here you see the uh, 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 Y stent in the airway. So this is a paper which we published uh, along with Felix Hirth some time ago. And this is again looking at the utility of both combined esophageal stenting and airway stenting. Again, the decision is of the clinic clinician. So all these patients were prospectively, uh, a prospective maintained database. Clinic, the decision of the clinician, which stent has to be put in first. Heidelberg has an advantage because they, even the, the pulmonologist will there put in the esophageal stent. So they are mainly endoscopist. The point that came out of this is in patients with TO fistulas, there were 112 patients, the largest series published so far. Quality of life improves if you use a, uh, if you do stenting of the uh, tracheoesophageal fistula. And uh, so this is what uh, is here. I mean, this is a complicated uh, graph here, but if you, the, what this graph shows you is, 
if you have a TO fistula affecting the right main bronchus, that means it's quite advanced, survival is lowest, and as you go towards the bifurcation, and if you, as you move towards the left main bronchus, and you go towards the carina, that's the, or, or in the trachea, your survival is better. Now, uh, a small, this is a paper, you know, uh, the question is, uh, do you want to do uh, debulking in a patient who, who is planned for surgery? Can that be there? So this is another paper which we uh, was published, again uh, done with uh, Felix Hirth and myself. We did this many years ago. We looked at 74 patients. All patients had a surgery, uh, had an interventional procedure done followed by surgery with curative intent. Of course, rigid was used in all the patients and the operator could use whatever they wanted. Uh, hot, that is coring, laser, argon. What clearly shown here is the pre and post, there is a clear improvement in PFT as it is expected. So FEV1 improves, FVC improves. And what this can do is, you know, um, this can permit parenchyma sparing surgery. Say for example, if you have a lesion in the right main bronchus, you treat the lesion in the right main bronchus, and you know, uh, and that in the, and suppose if the lesion is coming from the middle lobe upstairs, or it's coming from the right upper lobe into the right main bronchus, you know, you uh, somebody who would be qualifying for a numerectomy could qualify for a lobectomy or a bilobectomy. So that's the benefit of this. Now, quickly sh uh, sh uh, switching gears, I, I wanted to show you a case of a diode laser. This patient already had a carcinoma tumor. This patient was advised, look at the lesion here. Now, this patient has been advised to undergo a pneumonectomy and is referred to us for, you know, uh, to our center for pneumonectomy. We said, no, hang on. Let us try to remove. You know, I showed you the paper earlier. If you can do uh, uh, therapeutic bronchoscopy, you may be able to convert or limit the surgery. So, you see here, with diode laser, he's completely blocked, okay? This individual is completely blocked here. With diode laser, we could, uh, you know, I, I'm showing you, look at this. We can debulk it. Now, after debulking it, at a particular extent, I could not, uh, uh, you know, remove it more. It was very much adherent to the wall. So we stopped here. We did imaging here. After doing the imaging, it turns out that only a small portion of the tumor is pending. And this patient who was referred for a pneumonectomy underwent just a bronchotomy with wide excision and primary suturing without luminal compromise. So this is how if you use interventional pulmonology appropriately, you could, I mean this guy is a young guy, 27 year old, he would have had to live with one lung and now he's actually living a normal life with two lungs. So therapeutic bronchoscopy interventions before surgical dissection of cancer or any malignancy, you know, you should always look for the role and particularly in the current era where, you know, the game is changing as far as the immunotherapy and targeted therapy is concerned for lung cancer. Now quickly, a little bit, I want to show you about benign lesions now. We move gears. This is an individual who had a prolonged intubation, tracheostomy, non-healing wound at the tracheostomy site. And then in Christmas, he develops uh, stridor and then he comes to us so now he comes to us this is just a subglottic lesion here has been seen by many uh, uh, you know uh, some other colleagues also you see here there are two lesions here there is one lesion here so we're trying to now remove this uh, little bit of the you know burning this lesion here and it turns out that there was also suture material so that suture material is also removed so from one jaw of the uh, forcep, we tried to just remove some of the lesion there. So you see here, this lesion was actually removed using just cautery at that time. And, for, and then we go down here, and this is uh, subsequently after a week or so, on the right side, you see how the airway is here, okay? So now we were lucky here, okay? This is completely, you know, healing quite well. This, this gentleman did well. He sent us his PFT from Goa from time to time. What is the risk here? The risk is whenever you use a cautery, be prepared that this can restenose. So restenosis is very common, but you know this. You uh, and if you can clearly see here, uh, it was a very challenging. Trying, I, mean, I didn't have the knife at that point. You start a procedure, you don't have the knife, so you use the lower jaw of the forcep to burn the tumor. So an example of this. Now another example: 23-year-old. Uh, we thought that yes, she's lost weight, difficult in breathing, has hemoptysis, has wheezing, uh, received bronchodilators here. 
again uh, did a snare. You know, we thought she will bleed like anything, but absolutely bloodless surgery here. And uh, clearly you see here, we've got here, and we removed this, and this actually turned out to be tuberculosis, uh, culture positive tuberculosis, and healed very well. Now, this is a patient who had a CA glottis, has a tracheostomy, and gradually he's lost his uh, speech over a period of time. So now uh, we said, okay, we try to uh, use, uh, you know, we thought this is a recurrence of the CA glottis this gentleman had. So yes, we undertook resection, you know, resection, little bit of, uh, uh, you know, contact laser, you know, the, bra the base is broad, so somehow trying to scrape off the base, we thought it was uh, malignancy. But then, you know, you can see here, finally you can see the tracheostomy here. Yeah. So entire this airway made, and it turned out to be just granulation tissue. Fortunately, again, you know, despite using broad base, cautery, etc., no restenosis, this guy could be decannulated and was fine. Now, again, another example of uh, electrosurgery with uh, uh, this thing, you know, bronchoscopy shows a mass lesion. It turns out that she has eventually turned out to be carcinoid. Now, what is important when you look at such type of lesions? We look at such lesions here, yeah, we are using a snare. Again, you know, this is into the distal, uh, uh, distal main bronchus here. So yes, snare is done, it comes off very well, and then what do you find here? It's always important to go back and see uh, how the airway is after you remove a lesion here. And uh, you look on the other side that you've not dropped anything on the other side. So this was just a check bronchoscopy, okay? We thought, okay, uh, now it's everything's, and now you go down here, you see the lesion, there's more lesion here. Okay, there's still more lesion down here. So the main, this is below. So now, because I could not use any cautery something, so we've used contact laser here and trying to just create an opener airway. So this patient was again referred for a pneumonectomy because, uh, you know, involvement in the left main bronchus, etc. So it was very fortunate for this patient. Uh, we removed this. She was followed up. She had residual narrowing in the left main bronchus. Fortunately, has not progressed. FEV1 is compromised. Age is low and therefore not willing for surgery. So this is almost done 2011. We, last we saw her was almost three years ago. So until three years ago, she was, she was fine. Now quickly, a little bit about balloon dilatation. There's somebody who's going to speak on transplantation. I know that. But again, I, I put this here, one of the first dilatations I did. You see here, this is, these are the sutures here. This is an anastomotic uh, stricture. And then you put in a balloon here. We used to use, uh, the, these are not the CRE balloons. These are uh, other balloons here. And after the balloons, you could clearly see that there is uh, opening of the airway lumen very well. We've done some work on that. Uh, we've shown here that in this particular paper that if you have anastomotic related trans, uh, stenosis, only 20% will survive or, or will suffice with balloon dilatation. You have to do it twice. Many of them will go ahead and need a stent placement. But now things have become different. Surgical techniques are slightly different here. You are doing more distal anastomosis and uh, you know, but it's extremely important. You know, you, you need to have good distal anastomosis. You've got a transplant program happening now and then, you know, your ischemic times also we believe are there and good perioperative check bronx and uh, avoiding, you know, the amphoterosin nebs and all, they help, but that's a different story. Anyway, so this is what it is. Now quickly and for a sarcoid patient, you know, airway sarcoid can be very, very nasty. You know, you've treated this patient with every, everything, okay? And now she's still breathy. You can see multiple, multiple stenosis. What do you do? So we do multiple dilatations, okay? The goal of this patient was she wanted to be independent in doing her household work and going to the ground floor or in the society compound to do the shopping for the groceries. She wanted to be independent. So we took her up after, you know, not knowing how much this would help. But uh, eventually, yeah, you see multiple levels of uh, dilatations are being done here for this particular patient here. And uh, yeah, look at these stenosis. These are the sarcoid stenosis you see here and can be very, very uh, challenging. Okay, so you have to actually put proper guide wires, make sure that the balloon is going in properly, you know, don't, it's, it's, it's uh, avoid making false passages. 
you know, so one should not be overzealous because we are talking about segmental bronchial dilatation. This is not main bronchi, this is segmental bronchial dilatations here. And fortunately, after this patient had better mobility, better quality of life. So multiple segmental dilatation in a patient with sarcoidosis. So again, uh, when you talk about all these TB and other things, we did this paper where 50% patients could be treated with dilatation alone. And in benign lesions also, you know, they need stent placements. But again, I would say more, you should err more on the side of uh, using the silicone stents. Oh, this is done, sorry, yeah. Now, this is uh, another benign stenosis, okay? Now, this is what we face in life. What, what are the common benign stenosis we get? We get benign, you know, you get carcinoids, you can get, uh, uh, you know, some uh, adenoid tumors, you can get, um, uh, you, you can get post-intubation strictures, you can get TB strictures, sarcoid strictures, that's what I'm showing you. This patient, 57-year-old male, you know, had, uh, you know, uh, had TVD, was planned for cabbage, but just before surgery, he underwent ventilation for febrile illness and then came back with stridor. And now look at this. This guy comes in a stridor. Again, the knife was not there. Look at this opening, okay? Look at this opening, and it will show, you know, it's such a narrow uh, opening. Because, you know, you are recording all this. Uh, patient name is there, Amitji. And uh, sincere request, don't circulate this. I will be in trouble. Patient name is there on, on the on the videos, huh? So you have completely done this with only balloon dilatation. So this patient looked brilliant, you know, from a pinhole size to this level. After this, he underwent uh, cabbage also, needed another balloon dilatation, and then, you know, uh, so far fine. The reason why we followed this patient up is that whether he needed to have a resection done. So, you know, uh, in, in these, what I learned is whenever you have these small area of stenosis is not too long, it's not complex, always evaluate for the possibility of segmental resection. And if you have time, I can show you another complex post-intubation uh, tumor here. This is a young boy, had a febrile illness, was ventilated, uh, discharged from a, from a government hospital, and then he uh, comes back with stridor. He could not be intubated, okay? He could not be intubated and therefore he was an emergency tracheostomy was done. And clearly you would see, you know, the entire glottis is completely uh, uh, stenosed for this particular patient. You know, uh, after ENT reviews and all the reviews finally lands with us, we say we try to open. So now this I had to do in two settings, okay. We actually drilled a tunnel from there to see up to the tracheostomy. Can you see this? This was done in two sides. Look at the raw area. What do you do after this? The best thing for this is to put in a T-tube, yeah, like this. But not a T-tube like this, uh, invert the T-tube. Okay, because you want the T-tube to come up to the top. Look at this, this is how it is. So we did a T-tube after that, because after so much of cautery, it is going to reach the nose. So let it reach the nose around the uh, uh, T-tube. Leave the T-tube in for some time, and then you can remove the T-tube. There might be some luminal compromise, but at least the patient can phonate and maintain the stuff. So that was my last thing. So I've done a, my <laughs> yeah, bit of giving you a flare of malignancy. So you know how you do IP in malignancy and in benign disease. Thank you. It's always a pleasure to come here and give a talk. Uh, I know it's been too long, so I'll not take too much of a time and I'll go through the slides very quickly. Uh, this is a brief outline of my presentation. First, the introduction about the cryobiopsies, why we need to perform cryobiopsies. The principles of cryobiopsies, a couple of slides on that, followed by a pre-procedure evaluation and the contraindications, and the intra-procedural techniques, uh, followed by a post-procedure care, uh, the complications that may happen uh, during the cryobiopsies, and our data in the clinical cases uh, in the, uh, at the uh, end of the cases. So most DPLDs, as we know, are quite heterogeneous and there are patchy and, and are uh, spread throughout the lungs in patchy manners, both macroscopically and microscopically, uh, which necessitates the use of large biopsy specimens for subtyping all the histopathological features. Uh, we are aware with even the best of uh, performers doing a forceps small biopsy, diagnosis of DPLD other than IPF, where we don't need to do any more biopsies, is just about 20 to 30 percent, whereas surgical lung biopsies gives us the diagnosis in about 90 percent of cases, 
but then it has its own limitations in terms of the skill and the infrastructures. So as I, I, I this is my favorite slide. This is uh, Dr. Udayan Kachi, a very good friend and a great histopathologist who's been working with us for almost a decade now. So I always keep joking with him that uh, most ILDs are as uh, 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 variant as his uh, facial hair. <laughs> And uh, that's what it is all about. So why we need to uh, focus on cryobiopsy? Look at this data. Uh, this, is, uh, this was published in the Blue Journal in 2016, where they looked at the data in US across all centers from 2000 to 2011. And you won't believe there was a cohort of 32,000 patients who had undergone a surgical lung biopsy in US in this study. And out of this, more than 10,000 deaths were there intra-hospital, before the patients left the hospital, there were more than 10,000 deaths. So surgical lung biopsy has a significant mortality. So if we go to the other side of the globe, uh, this was a prospective trial done in Australia uh, across nine tertiary care centers where they looked at about 80 patients and in the same settings they did a surgical lung biopsy versus a cryobiopsy and they looked at the advantages of a, uh, cryobiopsies. And this is our data from our center, which was awarded an Indian Chess Society travel grant at the NAPCON in 2019. And um, I was awarded for the uh, APSR bronchoscoping and interventional techniques award in 2019 in Vietnam. So this study we conducted, uh, we did a cryobiopsy in 42 consecutive patients. And we took four samples. The first two samples were taken by forceps biopsy followed by the next two samples taken by a cryobiopsies and we looked at the diagnostic yield uh, which was there and in fact in the cryobiopsy we got a, a diagnostic yield of about more than 90 percent compared to a forceps biopsy where the our yield was around only 45 percent. So coming to cryobiopsies uh, this is a very nice slide uh, if you can see the uses of cryo probe in the present era. Uh, if you look at the lower uh, lobes of the both the lungs where I put up that. See, I'll, I'll, uh, dis I'll differentiate the use of cryoprobe biopsies into diagnostics and therapeutics. So for the diagnostic purposes, the cryoprobes are used for diagnosis of ILDs uh, or rather DPLDs for da along combination with the radial EBUS for peripheral pulmonary lesions. And we have also started using cryoprobes in uh, exudative pleural effusions of unknown origin. And when you look at the therapeutic aspects of cryoprobe, uh, it's used in aspiration, pulmonary hemorrhages, obstructing central airway tumors, and benign airway st central airway stenosis. So there's always a debate uh, between how to use, when to use, what to use. And I always say, for the best results, it's not the fire or the ice, it's always together. Cryosurgical techniques when used in conjunction with heat therapies such as laser, cauteries and APCs gives us the best results. Uh, the, the indications are similar except when there is an urgency to treat. And unlike heat therapies, there are no airway perforations, no airway stenosis, no airway scarrings and the, there are no structure formations. And over and above such patients, they generally are O2 dependent. So, those uh, O2 concentrations when you're doing a procedures did not be reduced. In fact, it can be increased to 100% at all. This is a Joule Thompson effect and this is the principle of cryobiopsy which I'll not go into the detail. Uh, but we need to know that what are the cryosensitive objects and what are the cryoresistance. So skin, nerves, endothelial tissues, granulation tissues and the mucosal tissues are very, very cryosensitive whereas Connective tissues, fibrotic tissues, nerve sheets, fatty tissues, and cartilage are cryoresistance. And if at all, if you are going to take home anything from this presentation, this is the slide you should take home. Uh, this is exactly the place where you should put in a prior probe. If you put it too much into a subpleural area, then you will risk a pneumothorax. If you do it in the middle part, you will end up into a big hemorrhage. And if you do it in the central airway, uh, you will end up getting a cartilage in your diagnostic uh, uh, results. Uh, this is the machine Urbe Cryo 2 which all of you are aware of it. And these are the different types of probes. I will rush through the slides. The pre-procedural tech checklist, uh, uh, quickly I will go through it. Uh, a DLCO less than 40% is a total no-no. FEC less than 50%. A patient who is on more than 4 liters of oxygen 
and a pulmonary hypertension of more than 60 on an echo. Uh, of course, the uh, antiplatelets, uh, if you are using the, if the patient is on older antiplatelets such as Ecosprin or Clopidogrel, try to uh, stop it before three days prior to the procedure. The newer antiplatelets, uh, you can stop it 24 hours before the procedure. Anesthesia, I think Pradeep, uh, uh, there are different ways of using it. Uh, we are very comfortable doing it with a rigid bronchoscope and a jet ventilation. I think people here, some of them, I think Pradeep and everyone is using uh, just the ET tube, if I'm, a, if I'm not wrong, and so is Manish. So I think you, uh, we are more comfortable because we are better able to manage the hemorrhage uh, with a rigid bronchoscope. The contraindications, uh, all those contraindications for a uh, general anesthesia need to be taken. A platelet counts less than 75,000. A PAO2 levels of less than uh, 50 mm. Uh, of course, pregnancy is always a contraindication. And um, uh, DLCO less than 40%. Intraoperative checklist. I think when you're performing a cryobiopsis, at least uh, you should need a uh, very well sta uh, prepared staff to do it. Rest all, I'll not go into the details uh, because of the lack of time. The positioning of the cryoprobe is very, very important. So uh, you can use a CM, but it depends on how well you're versed with the procedure. Initially, we used to use the CM. Now we do not use it anymore. But as I showed, as I showed in my the first, uh, uh, first earlier slides, that uh, if you are using a cryoprobe for a therapeutic purpose, the frontal freezing is an ideal technique. If you are using it for a diagnostic purpose, tangential freezing is an ideal technique for that. This is the removal tool. Uh, it helps us in fast removal and um, uh, it supports the reproducibility of biopsies and standardization because it minimizes the crush effect if you're using it with that. And plus it causes the less damage to the probe as well. Uh, this is a cryoprobe catching or bouncing on internal aspect of friction. This is very important video. We need to look into it. If you are using a C-arm, you will see that when the patient coughs, uh, there can be a bouncing of, uh, of the pleura that will happen. And that is where you need to stabilize your probe because otherwise you will end up into creating a pneumothorax. And this is how you measure a probe pleura distance. Um, I don't know, uh, people here use uh, uh, CM with uh, doing a cryobiopsies, Minesh? Uh, okay, Sorry. so uh, we, this is an ideal way, we do not use, we stopped using it, we basically after so many procedures, it's, we are comfortable, but if you are using a CM, this is how you do it, uh, this is, this is you go touch the pleural surface and then take about 10 mm retraction and uh, uh, that is an ideal position to take a biopsy from. But when you're using a CM, Amit Bhai, we need to take a, this technique is only best when you're used in little segments of any lobe. If you're going into an anterior or a posterior segment using this technique, it is not going to show you anything at all. It will just show you that it's still there. So that is one thing that we need to take into it. This is how you use a Fogarty uh, balloon. Uh, check the position and the, whether it's uh, once you inflate it before the procedure. I'll quickly rush through it in the interest of the time. And after the biopsy, the balloon is inflated, I think. So coming down to different uh, types of uh, probes, uh, which includes a f uh, influence of activation type, probe types, tissue concern. Now, uh, a Biopsy is determined by the weight and the diameter of the uh, pr uh, biopsy uh, specimen that we get. And it depends on kind, the kind of probe that we use. The different probes that are there, uh, 2.2, 1.9, 1.7, 1.1. This is a difference between the size of probes. Uh, we started off with 1.9 and we have shifted to 1.1 which gives us a smaller piece of biopsies compared to 1.7 or a 1.9, but there is a lesser chance of bleeding and practically no pneumothorax and eliminates the use of intubation of use of rigid scopes. Uh, but there is a catch-22 situation with an oversheath that needs to be focused upon. They have, Arbe has come out with an oversheath when using a 1.1 uh, uh, probe, but the problem is that the size of biopsy is quite limited with the inner diameter of the oversheath and at times it gets stuck, the biopsy samples get stuck into that. 
so plus the oversheath causes a crush rt effects due to the narrow space between the probes and the oversheath the only advantage of an oversheath with a 1.1 probe where i find is when i'm using it along with a radial ebus to biopsy a peripheral uh, lung lesions this is a no brainer we all are practicing in, in india and i think i'll not waste any time on it. it's it's uh, what is very clearly a reusability Post procedures just take a chest X-ray after a couple of hours and patients can go home the same day. Uh, the coming to the complications, I think the commonest complications are the pneumothorax and bleeding. If you're using a CM, you can minimize both of them. Bleeding, as you, I, I think with 1.1 probe, the bleeding, bleeding is quite less. And this was a study which looked at a 90-day cryobiopsy, uh, the readmission rates, and it was less than 2%, and the mortality was less than 1%. So, where all can we use beyond the, uh, where all we can use the cryoprobe biopsies? Uh, so, this is a nice uh, uh, two studies which I have kept here. One looks at the prognostic value of TBLCs uh, for IPF, which is a retrospective validation study, and the other is a prospective multicentric trial. Uh, both perform, uh, are, uh, were there in ERJ, and both have looked at about 200 patients and uh, uh, has shown us the advantage of using more and more cryobiopsies. How much time do we have? Two minutes. Yeah, I think I should be there. But in God we trust, this is a very famous quote, but all others must have data. And this is a very famous quote from M uh, one of the books I had read long back, Emperor of All Melodies by Siddharth Mukherjee. So this is our data. Uh, we've done about 104 cryobiopsies with a 1.9 probe. With a 1.1, we have done about close to 87 uh, things. I'll not go into much details. Um, cryotherapy, cryoprobe biopsies in thoracoscopies. Uh, we have done about 67 of them. And uh, malignant pleural uh, mesothelioma. The be best advantage of doing a pleural cryobiopsies is when I'm suspecting a mesothelioma because then it helps us in getting an IHC done. Cryobiopsies in lung cancer diagnosis, I think Amit mentioned it earlier that we now need to do ALK, EGFR, PDL, everything, and that's where it makes some bigger indications. And um, now that SIMS has performed their first lung transplant, and I must congratulate the whole team and Amit specifically, personally, for doing that successfully. Uh, see, we are all aware that the most commonest complications is a lung allograft uh, rejection, and with bronchiolitis obliterans, uh, being so common complication of lung transplant, um, getting a bigger piece of uh, bigger piece uh, in that uh, will help us in uh, determining allograft rejections much at a much faster rates. A lot get to know it. Dr. Chajar has already sp uh, spoken about this. Uh, we can use it as a cryo debridement. Cryo debridement. Wherever we have put a stent uh, for the stent in growth, we have used cryoprobe biopsies to remove the, to devitalize the growth, instant growth. And there's a couple of questions I'll take uh, about a minute more. Uh, this is the first case, if someone can tell me and can diagnose anything on this x-ray. Varun, x-ray. This is, I'll just give you a brief history, a uh, 32 year old, um, office going uh, women. I'll take a minute more. I'll give you a clue, it's pretty difficult. 32 year old uh, with cough, that's it. No, oh. it's, a, it's a right lower zone lesion, coin lesion if you can say, this is a pet. This was the only lesion. This patient uh, why I put it up is she at the age of 33 with that lesion and a PET scan she has gone this eight procedures in one and a half months right from a basic bronchoscopy to linear radial transbronchial lung biopsy CT guided biopsy sternal biopsies and CT guided biopsy done from lesion involving a manubrium with no diagnosis and after which they came to us and this is what we did. We just did a radial probe EBUS and used a cryo probe. The only problem with all the above procedures was that they were not able to get the tissues right at that time. So that's where our combining a cryo probe with a radial EBUS is, is very, very important. It helps. This case again, again, uh, 
this is pulmonary hemangioendothelioma i used a uh, epc and a cryo everything together but in the interest of the time i'll not show the videos uh, I have not done any of them. <laughs> there was a smile lesion which they found on a city. I, I know that question would have arised at you, but I don't have the cities with me, otherwise I would show you. There was a smile infection there where they tried to do it because they had practically done everything which was possible. <laughs> so they were hitting anything and everything which was looking suspicious anywhere. Uh, These are the videos. Uh, this was pulmonary, pulmonary hemangioendothelioma. This was a tracheal tumor we removed. Uh, put a stent uh, as well after that. Uh, I'll not go into this. And this is again a very interesting case. Uh, this we had sent it to Mayo Clinic to Dr. Teisler. Uh, you can, I could not have, this is from 2018 and did not have the images. So I just put it here. That's, this particular case was interesting as there was no mass lesion on imaging or bronchoscopy. The HRCT was suggestive of an ILD UIP pattern, right? Uh, so we, we were suspecting a uh, deep net uh, because it was producing a microcarcinoid tumor, tumorelates, uh, expressing a synoptosepsin and chromatin A. We don't have a pathologist, I think it's left. Uh, so that is the reason that those are the patients where cryobiopsies can be very, very helpful. I'll not go into this video. This is how we give the reports. Uh, so take home messages, understand the bronchial anatomy, orient yourself, understand the risk benefit ratios, pre-procedure evaluation, the rescue techniques and when not to do. And these are the only two pe people in my life which I am forced to listen. One of them is my histopathologist, other one I don't need to tell. <laughs> Fine, thank you. Good evening to all of you. First of all, I'd just like to apologize because I've almost lost my voice. So it's just a bit difficult to actually talk, but I'll try to quickly wrap this topic because obviously it's quite late and because of lack of time. So what exactly is the role of interventional pulmonology in lung transplant? So I first want to talk about the ideal situation. So whenever we do a lung transplant, ideally, we want the patient to be extubated on about day two, day three, day seven, he's basically in the ward by two to three weeks, he's basically home. And, you know, the ideal situation is when he doesn't have any complications, especially any airway complications and his life is actually much better, he's off oxygen. But, you know, whenever we talk about an ideal situation, what exactly is the role of interventions, okay? On a lighter note, I just follow three basic steps. So my first basic step as a transplant pulmonologist is I always blame the surgeon because if something goes wrong, it's always the surgeon's fault. Unfortunately, if you have a good surgeon, you go to step number two. Step number two, you blame the intensivist or the anesthesiologist because post-operatively, they have probably managed, you know, not correctly. If you have got a good intensivist, you basically go to step number three, which is you blame the underlying chronic disease. Now, obviously, this is the step where, you know, every patient who's had a bad disease will obviously undergo a lung transplantation. So, the transplant pulmonologist must always safeguard himself. You know, you should never take the blame. So, on a more serious note, when exactly are we supposed to consider interventions? I've just got these three basic steps. First is overlap with general respiratory. What does this mean? So whenever we talk about general respiratory, any indications for intervention is going to be the same post-transplant. For example, if you've got mediastinal lymphadenopathy, even in a general respiratory or post-transplant, you are going to do uh, an EBUS. So there is absolutely no change in all general respiratory indications. The second is something which is known as surveillance bronchoscopies. I would like, to, um, like you to pay attention to the word surveillance. What it basically means is it's a protocol of doing bronchoscopies in regular intervals and transbronchial lung biopsies in a fixed interval. The main purpose of doing surveillance bronchoscopies is you just want to catch rejections early. And third, I want to mention is that every center has got a fixed protocol. The place where I uh, did my fellowship, we had a minimum of three transbronchial lung biopsies, which we used to do as a protocol in, uh, as in surveillance bronchoscopies. Now, what exactly is TBLB? I don't need to go much detail, but there are certain changes uh, in TBLB of normal patients and TBLB post-lung transplants. The second point where I put a star is 
always whenever a patient is freshly post lung transplant these are the patients who have got a very high incidence of bleeding so you are supposed to be very careful and do the procedure extremely careful the reason for this bleeding is because the pulmonary vasculature is still at a high pressure post transplant it will take some time to settle down the the third point which i have mentioned is whenever you do a normal bronchoscopy what we prefer is be extra liberal with the lignocaine which you do especially in the upper respiratory tract and in the vocal cords because remember these are the patients who have got a huge clamshell incision it's almost cut transversely and these patients have got diaphragmatic dysfunctions and muscular dysfunctions it's very difficult for them to maintain a proper breathing rhythm which is extremely essential for transbronchial lung biopsies and the fifth point which i have mentioned is i always prefer that it should be under cm guidance because as per the ishlt this is the statement you need a minimum of 6 to 11 transbronchial biopsy passes so that your pathologist will get a minimum of five good pieces this is the minimum what is required when you want to diagnose acute rejections now this is just a diagrammatic rep a representation which i found in the bts guidelines is just the same as to how you do a transbronchial lung biopsy you just select the segment in which you want to do the biopsy you wedge your scope and through the working channel you can just push your forceps uh into that segment and then you know what you do is you basically synchronize the opening and closing of your forceps with the patient's breathing and ensure that you get a good piece and then you can just use a shearing technique and then you can come out now this is you know i really would like to thank dr arpan shah because he had a lovely talk now you obviously mentioned about that one slide in which you were talking about cryobiopsy in post lung transplant now we say that transbronchial lung biopsy is the gold standard in post transplant you've got very less papers in which you prove evidently what is better this is the only one paper which i could find this is in 2022 and this is the only one paper in which what they did is 35 lung transplant recipients they simultaneously underwent a transbronchial lung biopsy and a cryo cryo biopsy in the same sitting and what it eventually showed is that the cryo biopsy provided an improved diagnostic yield for uh, diagnosis of rejection and in fact in almost in 30% of cases you could change the classification of the rejection because the cryo biopsy actually had a better yield but i would still say still the gold standard is tblb we need a lot of more work in cryo biopsy specifically post lung transplant and my third and my final point is airway interventions this is the part which i personally really hate post lung transplant because it it's associated with a lot of complications now this slide basically just shows the anatomy if you can see the main bronchus we need to understand that it has got two blood supplies it's got a bronchial circulation and it's got a pulmonary circulation so whenever we go on retrievals we are going to cut the the donor bronchus in the main stem and what this eventually what it means is when you are actually suturing the bronchus there is a loss of bronchial artery circulation in that particular area because this is going to have collateral circulations and it takes up to 4 weeks so your stump essentially only depends on the pulmonary circulation for its blood supply and is extremely prone to ischemia this is the main basis as to why you have airway uh stenosis in these patients again this is a very good slide in the first uh, diagram you can see the dual circulation which is present which is the bronchial and the pulmonary the middle slide is basically in the early post transplant in which the bronchial circulation is completely gone the anastomotic segment depends only on the pulmonary circulation it's only after about 4 weeks or something that once again you've got bronchial artery uh collaterals and that is the third uh slide what exactly are the worsening factors for this of course pro prolonged donor ventilation more than 7 days is a very high risk factor whenever we go on retrievals and if you've got a donor who's more than 7 days on a ventilator it's a, it's a risk factor for uh, airway interventions and for ischemia for ischemia increased donor bronchial stump is something which is also associated with poor circulation and increased uh, stenosis 
infections there are two infections which are particularly very important pseudomonas as well as aspergillus these are the two which have been associated with more uh, stenosis size mismatch is something which is the most important factor so when you oversize or when you undersize actually for airway interventions oversizing is a very big problem because when you are ultimately putting the lungs inside a thoracic cavity which is small it gives rise to a lot of extrinsic compression which will in rise give to circulatory disorder so that is when your airway ischemia increases and these patients really do extremely badly and of course you've got um, Medic medications such as high dose oral corticosteroids and serolimus especially which is a rapamycin derivative you don't use serolimus in the first 90 days post transplant as a rule telescoping anastomosis is more of a surgical intervention that is what technique they use basically to suture these are just some uh, pictures which i could get in which you can actually see bronchus intermediates and you know you can see the mainstem bronchus which have actually undergone severe stenosis and deposition of granulation tissue and once a patient reaches this level it's a nightmare to actually get him out now three main modalities which you use basically for intervention when you are dealing with such situations the first was something which even dr prashant chajar sir had mentioned it's balloon bronchoplasty you know this is a diagram of the balloon you know you've got different sizes what we used to use was CRE balloons uh, the maximum diameter which we have used was 20 millimeters and uh, so so the technique is quite simple you just have a guide wire which you pass through the stenosis and then you pass the entire balloon uh, the entire balloon over through the guide wire to the stenosed area and through a bronchoscope you've got like a pistol like structure in which you put in adequate pressure so that the balloon actually increases in size now this is a very good diagram which I could get on the left you can see the stenosed segment on the CT which is again uh, you know in, in the bronchus intermedius and post uh, balloon bronchoplasty you can see the third diagram that is when it's actually improved. Now <clears throat> as far as endobronchial stents are concerned this is again you know a paper which was done by Dr. Prashant Chajar sir he's unfortunately left for today but this is all the way back in 2001 in which uh, you know he's talking about endobronchial stents in the man management of airway complications now in this this is actually the conclusion which was there in his paper you can see that there's a lot of increase in fev1 in these patients the second point which he mentioned which i have to which you know which i will just like to repeat is that it's only up to 20 percent of patients who actually respond to balloon bronchoplasty you ideally need more procedures and you need repeated settings and by the time the patient is better it's actually a downhill course now these are the type of uh, stents you've got metallic as well as silicon stents now in transplant the indication for each is quite different we use metallic basically when you have got granulation tissue overgrowth and when you've got post transplant bronchomalacia that is when you prefer using metallic stents over silicon stents the more distal the obstruction is and the more distal the stenosis is that is when you prefer usage of silicon stents but this is just a diagrammatic in which you know they've just shown the silicon stent but trust me when i tell you we have lost two patients when they reached to such an extent where you actually needed stenting of the airways the second complication which we really encounter post stenting is fungal colonization so both the patients which I'm actually talking about were, were, you know, they expired because of fungal colonization and subsequent development of sepsis. Now, <clears throat> you've got the third type of stents which is now known as hybrid stents but very little work done in the case of hybrid stents post lung transplant. Now, this is a publication in Journal of Thoracic Disease in 2022 and, you know, this is... I mean they've actually done it in 50 patients in which 376 stents were totally deployed and you can just read the statement there were only two cases of major stent related complications so obviously a lot more work needs to be done where we can confidently put forth the usage of hybrid stents so my take home message basically is remember the ideal situation ideally you need you should need very little interventions from a pulmonology point of view second surveillance bronchoscopy is extremely important because what we see clinically is that the patient is walking in fine the spirometry is good but you do a transbronchial biopsy and they have got a1 or a2 rejection so you really need to treat these patients with 
pulse steroids as well as changing of their immunosuppression. Third, which I mentioned, you know, which even uh, Arpan uh, spoke about is TBLB versus cryobiopsy. Theoretically, yes, cryobiopsy is more better compared to TBLB, but we need much more work, much more evidence in which we can confidently change protocols. Fourth is stenting, as I mentioned, you know, silicon, metallic and hybrid stents. Uh, world over silicon stents is the one which is currently maximum used. Last is we have got a lot of scope for further research to be done, especially post lung transplant. We've got further modalities which needs to be worked upon, which we can change in our protocols, which will include laser reductions, you know, NDAC laser. We need combination therapy, which is like balloon bronchoplasties followed by stenting and the type. And lastly, hybrid stents are something in which we need a lot of more work and research on. Thank you so much.